Okay, so uh, let's start the morning. So um, we're going to start with Peter Jones. I uh, was going to talk about product formulas for measure and application to analysis in geometry, and I guess you see the product formula already. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I'd first like to uh, thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful conference and for the honor of speaking here, but most of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dennis. Um, so, uh, my career was heavily influenced by, uh, by Dennis and especially his way of thinking. I'd just like to make a comment about that. So, there, there's a rare number of people who see many things from up on, on high. And there are many people who see one small thing from up on high. And uh, I think the, the real trick of great mathematics is when you see many things from uh, um, with, with a certain perspective, and you, you learn how to integrate them. And this is where I think the real magic in uh, mathematics uh, comes in. So I'd, I'd really like to thank him very much because, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, Dennis, but you were extremely influential uh, in, my, in my career at many, many stages. Um, what, what? <laughs> okay, I'll say it. So I, I should also tell the audience that um, Dennis is the only, uh, well, first of all, everyone also knows that Dennis is the world's most enthusiastic uh, mathematician. He's enthusiastic about many things, so much so that he tried to go through security in the Paris airport where I was leaving on a flight. He took me to the airport and uh, we had to go through, I had to go through security and he said, that's okay, I'll pretend I'm blind. And he actually put his arm on around me and tried to walk through security through me and the plot was foiled because he said, blind, I, I am blind, not in French, but in Portuguese. And <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> you can't, you cannot deny it. I could not make up this story. <laughs> And actually, we were having a fantastic uh, math conversation. I was really hoping that uh, this was before you know the bad days. I was really hoping they would let Dennis through. OK, so I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, joint work with uh, Mariana Chernier. There she is uh, right there. Um, and I'm, it's going to be about product formulas uh, for measures uh, and applications to analysis and geometry. So this is going to be some sort of uh, combinatorial slash quantitative uh, geometry, and one of the outputs is going to be theorems about uh, differentiability uh, of uh, functions, and in particular, uh, the Rademacher theorem. So um, this is supposed to be a very, very funny slide. So this is uh, a chart for the Sara Lee Corporation taken on, uh, I guess, 1st uh, fr uh, of May, I can't remember the year, and uh, it runs through the day, so the, the trading day closes, at least on the New York Stock Exchange, at 4 o'clock, and hence the, the 4 here. Um, SLE could also, of course, refer to the stochastic Livner uh, evolution, and there's going to be some connection uh, between uh, stochastic Livner evolution and this chart. So. Uh, all econ uh, undergraduates are, are taught to look at the price chart here. And they never look at the volume. So this is the volume. And the volume is very interesting. It's extremely spiky. And it's spiky in a particular way. There are these bursts of activity. Um, engineers call this type of signal bursty. And um, remarkably, they've had. Uh, They've had a very hard time just describing these. And there's, there's a, a hallmark of when you can describe something. And that is that you can simultaneously uh, simulate and analyze. You have to be able to do both. If you can't do both with a method, something is wrong with the method. So I'm going to show you a very simple uh, way to analyze this, uh, this type of signal. And then we're going to apply it to a geometric setting. Uh, so the geometric setting is not going to be one-dimensional. So this is so regard this as a probability measure, right? So you just take the volume for the whole day, and then you normalize it uh, to be one. 
And how would you describe this, this probability measure? So here's a very beautiful uh, theorem. It's, it's a re really more just like a lemma. The, the statement of the lemma is its own proof. Um, if you have a probability measure on the unit interval, so, so it's, it's, it's positive, just a positive Borel measure, then it, there's a unique representation. You have to worry a little bit about you know, what's an endpoint of an interval and you know, what happens when the product becomes zero, but there's a nice convention that makes this uh, representation unique. Um, and it's just a product over all dyadic subintervals of the unit interval of little things 1 plus ai hi. So here, here, here's the product. I'm going to leave it up here. And here's, here's the function h sub i. It's just plus 1 or minus 1. On the, so it's minus 1 on the left, and it's plus 1 on, on the right. And it's an easy algebraic exercise to see that this is true. So first of all, you just have to, let's see, if going in one direction, if you had a product like this, and all the coefficients are between minus 1 and plus 1, then this piece has absolute value less than 1, so every piece of the product is positive. So it's clearly positive, and it's, it's an induction argument to uh, check that it's, it has total integral 1 when you take finite products. Yes? Uh, so do you want to start with a measure, or do you want to build a measure? I just want to know what the symbol means. OK. I think you need to take a finite product here. So you no, 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 no. He's, he's asking, I think, a different question. I mean, I don't know what h sub i is either. Oh, here's h sub i. This is, it's, it's this function. You have a dyadic interval, and it's minus 1 on the left, and plus it's that function. And you just take products of these. Ah, oh, wonderful question. All the co <laughs> His was a setup question. Dennis's was not. Yes, so. No, I don't understand what it means. How does that formula compute a measure? I asked something. Let's go to the next page. No, 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 go back. No, no, let's, let's start with a measure. Let's start with a measure. Suppose we have. Can I have Mr. Sure. So, so, so the, there are two directions of the statement, right? Uh, so, so pi is a product. Pi is a product. So, it, so let's look at this. If you take finite products, it's a function. And then if you take an infinite product, you take weak star limits. Okay? And so the theorem is that, each, first of all, each finite product is a positive... Right, and it's a probability measure. It's a probability measure. And there is, uh, if you're given a measure, there's a simple way to compute these coefficients. So you have the right and left are, are uh, the, the right half and the left half of the interval. And so if you start with a measure, this is the algebra for how you compute AI. Okay? And if you, if you just take ai between minus 1 and plus 1, then you just calculate by induction on the scale that what you have integrates out to, to 1, and they're all positive. Okay? So, so this is the kind of basic theorem. And this uh, was introduced by Robert Pfefferman uh, Carlos Kennig and Jill Pfeiffer in a 1991 paper. It, for all I know, this formula was written down by Gauss in 1807, but I, I don't have a reference for that. I mean, it's uh, and now it's not just a, a, a one-dimensional 
result that any probability measure on the unit interval may like this. But there are versions that you can do in R2, R3, any dimension. And I'll, I'll draw the, the picture there. And so what you would do in, uh, for example, R2 is you need things that, so these, these things are, are like Haar functions. I'm going to call them little Haar functions. Usually Haar functions are normalized in L2, and these are normalized in L infinity to have norm 1. So in, in R2, you could work on the unit cube in R2. And if you took a dyadic cube uh, Q, you could uh, first divide it in, in the left hand and right hand uh, sides of it and put the function minus 1 and plus 1. And you know we could call that the Haar function in the h x direction for q. And then it turns out you have to, to so let's call this the, the left and this is the right. And then you would need two more functions. So let's look at the left. And then you would need the function minus 1 and plus 1. And you do the same thing on the right, minus 1, plus 1. And you have the result. Okay? So you multiply it. And you multiply. You multiply all these things out together. Okay, just, just as you multiply out. So each one has a coefficient. So there's a coefficient for this one. There's another coefficient for this one. There's a third coefficient. And you just multiply them out. How is that for your h over square? Is it going to be minus 1 plus 1 minus 1? Oh, oh, no, this is each cube has its own square. Uh, uh, sorry, each cube has its, has its own function. It doesn't just go minus 1 plus 1, minus 1 plus 1, minus 1 plus 1. OK? So th those would be what, what are called Rademacher functions that have big support. So, the, so what we want is each, each cube has, huh? Only dyadic Only, only dyadic cubes. Only dyadic. What is a dyadic cube? A dyadic cube is a cube so that is a product of dyadic intervals. And a dyadic interval has of length, say, 2 to the minus n, has left-hand endpoint j times 2 to the minus n, and right-hand endpoint j plus 1, 2 to the minus n, for some integer j. And then the beauty of these things is the next scale of dyadic intervals are nested perfectly inside. And that plays a crucial role in this product. So it allows the, the product to integrate out to exactly 1. OK? In higher dimensions, you're going to have a product over dyadic cubes. cubes. And right. And instead? I'm asking you what the function associated with the square cube is. So, so in two dimensions, we need 3. Three functions, three different functions for each cube. So this one has support on the entire cube. The next one, which looks in the y direction, has we need two functions, one for the left and one for the right. So the first function is supported on the left side, and it's minus 1 here, plus 1 there, etc. You, and you do. You have three different coefficients. So you have, you have uh, a coefficient a, q for the x direction between minus 1 and plus 1. And then you have a coefficient for the left side. And that's, again, between minus 1 and plus 1. And the same thing here. So we have three different coefficients. In, in Rd, you would have 2 to the d. Then you subtract 1 such functions. So, 
So I have to multiply 1 plus h. So now I multiply over all q, xq of z times 1. Oh, there's a, sorry, there's an a. So let's call this q x. And then I have 1 plus a q left. And then I have h left of z, and then the third thing, 1a q right, h right of z. All right? So it's, a, it's just a, again, it's a product. It's just the same as this. And that's the algebra. They are indexed by Q. There's a Q, and then there's a comma, and there's an R. All right. right. Why are you complaining about the H's? There's oh, on this one? Q L, Q R, right. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> how, how do you get a Dirac mass? Take all the coefficients equal to minus one. First stage, you compress all the mass to the interval 0, 1 half. At the next stage, all the mass goes to 0, 1 fourth, et cetera. OK? And OK. OK, so um, this turns out to be useful in signal processing. <coughs> so here's an example of a simulated bursty uh, signal of the type that comes up in uh, telecommunications. and. Here, what, what one has done is just taken a uh, probability density function on minus 1 to plus 1 and chosen all the coefficients randomly from this. right? And then you just multiply out, and you get such a bursty signal. And depending upon your, your distribution, you get different types of uh, burstiness. And and then it turns out that it's, it's a good idea to represent uh, your volume. So let's, let's go back a few. Look at the volume there. In terms, don't, don't represent it as a function. Repre just write it as a string of coefficients. Okay, you just have a string of coefficients, and that's your representation of the measure. And then that representation now lives in a very high dimensional space, and it carries a lot of geometry. And here, here's an analysis of, uh, uh, so there are 182 antennas, 14 days of data. This is uh, cell phone towers. And this is just to show you that you can classify the dates by doing some sort of nonlinear statistics on the coefficients. And they just automatically uh, assemble themselves. And now, uh, let's see, I want to go over to stochastic Leuvner evolution and show you that there's some sort of application here. And so probably a, a lot of you know about quasi-symmetric functions on the unit circle. So those are functions where um, if you look at the derivative, because it's a homeomorphism, uh, the derivative is some Borel measure. And you can talk about the measure on the left and the measure on the right. And therefore, you could just take this guy right over here. You just periodize to the circle. And you can represent the derivative by this. And then a function is quasi-symmetric if all of those coefficients a sub i are bounded away from plus 1 and minus 1. And you have to do this for all rotations of the dyadic grid. But, but what has the equation change? I mean, the, the coefficients change. The coefficients change. 
coefficients change and a, and a function is quasi-symmetric if for all rotations, all the coefficients are bounded away from minus 1 and plus 1. Okay? Uh, so stochastic Lewner evolution works the following way. You, you have an input, which is Brownian motion on the line. And you give it a speed, which is traditionally called kappa. And out of this, you build some conformal mappings, starting with the identity mapping. And then you have f sub t of z, where z is the complex variable in the upper half plane. And you have an ODE uh, for solving this. And this is the Lewner um, ODE. So it, it builds some strange wiggly curve that goes into the upper half plane. So the upshot is you start with Brownian motion on the line. That's your input. And this is supposed to give you a curve, a wiggly strange curve. And here it is. Okay. So this is uh, uh, an image of SLE 8 thirds. So kappa equals uh, 8 thirds. And that's a famous uh, picture. And we'll hear, I guess, lectures about this here. Um, and what I want to point out is, so this curve has some relation to welding curves. And in particular, um, Bayer's simultaneous uniformization theorem. So here's a picture by Jeff Brock of, of a uh, nice uh, limit set of a quasi-Fuchsian group. And you see this nice you know, fractal type curve. And the question is, is that type of fractal curve related to SLE? And the answer is yes, it is. So, so how? So the way, uh, it, so I don't want to go into a full description of how you, you do this because it's a little bit tangential to most of the discussion for today. But what you do is you, you uh, take a homeomorphism on the circle, and then you extend it to the plane to be homeomorphism. You solve a certain Beltrami equation, and you get a Jordan curve. Okay? And now this here, the, so there's a something, this is called a welding map construction. And you need an existence theorem that you can solve this, this um, Beltrami equation. And the classical case, which is, for example, here, uh, tells you you can solve it if all these, these coefficients are bounded away from minus 1 and, and plus 1. Okay, And so there's a well-known mechanism for building uh, Jordan curves, and even by putting in some group invariance. And it's, it's related to this, although it's not classically stated this way. It's just completely uh, identical, however. OK. And so just to show you that these product formulas are somehow related here, here's a way to get uh, SLE. So here, here's some work with uh, Kari Ostela, Antti Kupian, and Eero Saxman, um, which is that if we build a certain measure on the circle through a probabilistic mechanism, then almost surely it's a welding curve. And the curve is rigid in a certain sense. It's conformally rigid. And it turns out that this gives you another uh, method of producing real SLE. So for example, Scott Sheffield has a paper. And you have to do the above, which I haven't quite defined yet, twice. You have to glue together two different curves. And so now I want to show you the random measure. Yes? Uh, you are given a we're, we'll be given a homeomorphism of the circle. And the question is, does it arise from a Jordan curve in the plane? And the way you're right, that's the conformal welding. Ah, and the theorem says that it is, it is unique. Almost surely. So there's going to be a probability space. And almost surely, the welding will be unique. Rigid, etc. Okay, and so here what we do is um, we do something kind of strange. You exponentiate what's called the Gaussian free field. So the Gaussian free field is an object that that uh, very roughly speaking puts puts equal 
energy statistically at all length scales and all locations. If you look at, there's a, if you go to Google, go Google images of WMAP. Ten, ten to the ninth dollars, not for the, just this experiment, but for this, ex, this experiment cost on the order of 170 or 180 million dollars. It's a picture of the microwave background, or more precisely, the microwave background minus its mean value. And there are little teeny fluctuations. And uh, Larry Guth's father, Alan Guth, is the inventor of something called inflation theory. And it predicted, uh, because of a whole bunch of phenomena, that uh, you would see a very strange speckling pattern in the microwave background after uh, subtracting its mean value. And by gumbo, it's, there it is. Okay, And it's even better, of course, because there's something slightly, slightly wrong. And so many, many millions and billions of dollars more will be spent. There are new generations of satellites looking at this. So what is this? So we take an in, on, on, I'm going to cheat, and uh, I don't want to discuss the, the Gaussian free field in, in space or even R2. I'm just going to define it on the circle. So we take random uh, trigonometric sums on the circle. So these are sums over all values uh, of j. And I'm just going to sum cosines and sines of j theta. I'll put random coefficients in front of them. And these will be, um, they'll, they'll be like SLE kappa. I'll have uh, a Gaussian distribution with a prescribed variance. OK, so I just pick all these randomly. And then I have these factors j to the minus 1 half. So this cannot be an L2 function because, on average, that guy looks like plus or minus 1. So it's just statistically. So pretend it looks like absolute value 1. Right? The absolute value looks like 1. And then if this were an L2 function, you would square the sums of these guys. You get 1 over j. You sum it. Oops, it's infinite. Okay? So it's a rather easy theorem, uh, quite old, that almost surely this, this horrible object diverges everywhere. It's not an L2 function. It's not L anything. It's just, it's just bad. And now the surprise is that if you exponentiate this function, it becomes good. Right? How is that possible? Right? Well, you subtract uh, at each scale minus 1 over 2j. And then you get a Feynman Katz type formula, and, and you get, you get uh, so you take finite sums, you take a weak star limit, and the weak star limit is almost surely uh, a, a non trivial measure. That's a deep theorem of Jean Pierre Cahan. And then you normalize it to be a probability measure. And this is how you build. Uh, these strange random curves. And then the enemy here for, for doing this is that these, these coefficients, a sub i, in the, the product formula, or the quasi-symmetry condition, quite simply, um, they can be big. It's just a statistical phenomenon. You have to do some, some complicated uh, statistics and some construction so that the Beltrami machine will run. And it, runs, but just barely at the limits of tolerance. OK, so the point is there's, there's another type of random measure, and this builds geometric objects. And now we're going to change uh, completely and uh, come uh, to the main point of today's talk, which is uh, Rademacher's theorem, uh, something technical called tangent fields. And this is going to be joint work with uh, Mariana Chernier. Uh, so um, here, here's an interesting question. So the Rademacher theorem says that if you have a function from Euclidean space to some other Euclidean space that satisfies a Lipschitz condition, then it's differentiable almost everywhere. And, and OK, so it's, it's differentiable except on a set of measure 0. And the question is, is this sharp? So, so yeah, let's back up just a second. First of all, if you have one of these guys, 
a Lipschitz function, then it's differentiable almost everywhere. And now the question is going to be, if you are given a Lebesgue null set, a set of measure zero, can you find a Lipschitz function that's nowhere differentiable everywhere on E? No, it can't be. It can't, it can't be because of reasons of F sigmas, G deltas, and stuff like that. Okay? So it can be, we allow it to be uh, non-differentiable in other places, but demand that on this set. Okay? So this, this statement uh, is classical for D equals 1. If you have a Lebesgue null set in, in the line, then you can build uh, a nowhere differentiable function, well, differ, different, nowhere differentiable on E. And the way you do this is you cover E by small intervals. Okay, you have a countable number of, of intervals. You cover E, and you put plus 1 on them here. And that defines the derivative of a function. And it's, the function is clearly Lipschitz. Okay? And then the derivative looks like plus 1 at some scale on all of these intervals. And now you just go. Zero uh, you, yeah, you don't do, you define it. You, you could take it to be 0. So let's take it 0 outside. Just, we just need it bounded. So let's take it 0 outside. And now we go inside and we recover again with a very, very small set of intervals with each one. And you, you change the, the plus 1 to a minus 1. And you get a second function. And now there are two scales for any point uh, in, in this set. On one scale, like from here to here, the derivative looks like it's plus 1. But then it changes, and it looks like it's minus 1 on this. And so the, the derivative is going, hello, goodbye. And now you just repeat, and you go, hello, goodbye, hello, goodbye. And the derivative looks like it oscillates, and it does it infinitely often by just repeating this. So, so it's a very easy construction. And um, th this statement is, is not com completely correct. But for example, in uh, R2, um, if you're given a, a Lebesgue null set, you can't just map R2 to R. That will not do. There are, there are strange sets where if you take one function, there's going to be some function in this Lebesgue null set where the map is differentiable. So you have to map R2 to R2. And that, that's the theorem of Alberti, Chernier, and Price. And so, the, so what we're going to do is talk about mappings from Rd to itself okay? and show that in this case it's true. OK, so here's, here's uh, first the history. There's this beautiful uh, theorem of Alberti, Chernier, and Price that in 2D, uh, for any set of Lebesgue measure 0, there's a Lipschitz function from R2 to R2 that is nowhere differentiable on the set E. And it, there, there are two orthogonal components of the proof. So the first one is combinatorics. It's a, there's a two-dimensional trick that allows you to build certain objects. So here's the idea. So you want to copy this idea. Let me show you how to build a function that's not going to be differentiable in the y coordinate. Right? So it's, it's, and the reason is blackboards go like that. You know, I can't go like that. So, so the idea is to build Lipschitz slabs. So, so thin Lipschitz slabs. That's the analog of thin intervals. So these are, these are Lipschitz slabs, yes? Other example you've done is plus 1 and plus 1 half. Oh, that would have been fine. That would have worked. And then you yeah. would do like a homomorphism. That's right. Yeah, so you could build it. You can. Right. Um, so let me think. I guess the answer is yes. Yes. The answer is yes. And because whatever thing you build, you could, you could add um, plus 2 to the whole thing here. Wasn't the game to find the Lipschitz function? Yes, but, but a mapping. How about a mapping? Yes? 
you just add a big expansion constant, right? And then it becomes by Lipschitz. Okay. Right. And so, so what we would do here is we would have a, a, a collection of thin Lipschitz slabs, and then we would put, say, plus one here, plus one here, and then we would have to go inside all of these and get more thin Lipschitz slabs, but a very small set of them, and we put minus one, or one half. Yes? Oh, this is one coordinate function, right? So, so this is f2. So I'm going to build functions f1 and f2. And my mapping is going to be f is f1, comma f2. And this is a description of f2. Okay? So the y derivative looks like plus 1 approximately, depending on the Lipschitz constant. But think of the Lipschitz constant as being very small, plus 1 here. And then we go inside and we make it look like minus 1. And we repeat this idea. It's not, it's, it's not a triviality. And so hard work has to be done here. Lots of hard work. Why can you always separate the entire line? On the line? Because you can always cover any set with a disjoint set of intervals, half open, half closed. All right. Or you can just cover by open intervals, and they're disjoint. All right. It's much harder in R2, because now you're dealing with you know, you have these guys fighting like this with each other. Right. So these thin lips of chips, strips, what are they covering? They're covering the set E. We're going to completely cover E. Here's how I do it for F2. That's all you know. It has zero area. Is some difficult theorem to say you can cover it by lip chips, strips, or is that complex? It's a very difficult theorem. Thank you. <laughs> that was another setup question. That was a setup question. Yeah. So let me point out what we're going to do, though. No one says that that f two has to cover all of e. What we have to do is have the combination of f one and f two cover e. So some points will be covered by f two, and there the y derivative will not exist. Other points will be covered by f one, and there the x derivative will not. And that's sort of how it has to go, actually. There's kind of no way out of that. All right? And is F1 built by a rotation of the pitch or by a completely different method? Thank you again. OK, so now we will go on and, and, and discuss this. OK, so this, this now gets technical. All right? So is F, oh, is F1 built by rotation? Yes, it's a rotation of the picture. Yeah, there's only one, one picture. It's the same picture for each coordinate. Okay, so now the, here, here's something fun. Um, so you can ask your calculus students if um, a set of positive Lebesgue measure has a tangent at almost every point. And that's no response to yeah, the, the microphone. Okay. So this is going to be a different notion of tangent from uh, the usual one, and there's going to be some statement about um, right so let's just skip directly to the pictures okay so we think of now we have a set of, of small measure epsilon and and this is I'm going to state a local theorem so the set is going to be contained in a finite cube let's say the unit cube okay so here, here's the calculus picture we have a cone we have a plane and so you have a tangent, whoa, you have a tangent plane to maybe a surface, and then you, it means you can draw cones that go in two directions, right? So the normal direction would be going that way, and they don't intersect the surface locally. And we want some version of this for sets. So here, by the way, this is an alarming picture. It comes from Wikipedia, right? It's pretty amazing. Uh, not, not the blue boxes. I drew those. <laughs> this is a Lipschitz curve. So here's, here's what we want. So we have a set E. Let's, let's just talk about the plane from now on, because everything is going to be functorial uh, going from R2 to R3 to R4. 
So we want to split E into two pieces. And uh, one piece is going to, well, we're going to say that um, a, there's a tangent cone at a point in, in E. So the, the, think of the normal vector as pointing here. So it's a double-sided cone. If, and so it's going to have a tangent cone in this direction if, whenever you draw a Lipschitz curve in this double cone, and the Lipschitz constant is simply controlled by the slope of this cone, then it hits the set in small measure, which, which small linear measure, right? So we start with a set of two-dimensional measure. And now we want, for every Lipschitz curve, it's going to, in, in this direction, that it's going to hit the set in small measure. Okay? And the measure is going to be a power of the Lebesgue measure of E, the two-dimensional Lebesgue measure of E. So two-dimensional knowledge that now goes to, to knowledge about intersection with all Lipschitz curves of a certain, with, with, with uh, tangent vectors in a certain cone. So th this is E. So th this, this point was, was another point in E, and I didn't want to put a blue box over here because it would That's obstruct. In e. That's in E, right. So we started in a point in E, and then we look in any direction. OK. OK, so let's. So the worst, worst example here is supposed to be a box. So now I drew the picture in R3 so you can see a box. So you have a box of measure epsilon. Now. If you take any Lipschitz curve, it's going to hit it in the side length. Right? If it goes through the cube, that's the length that's going to hit it. And, and no matter how you divide up the cube into 15 pieces, you're always going to hit 1 over 15 times the side length. And the side length is epsilon to the 1 over d. No, you're not allowed to. The tangent, so the, so the, tangent, is, is, the tangent vector is always in a cone. So as you travel forward, you're simply, I mean, you can go up and down, but you so cannot go back. All along you're in the cone. Right, all, all along you're in the cone. Right. And that's the same cone. In the same cone. But the cone can't turn. The cone cannot turn. The cone is fixed in the same way. Right. Right, so let's go back. Yeah, correct. So once we fix this angle, then. And the, the orientation. And the orientation. Then, then we have to have a statement about all Lipschitz curves. So I mean, we have to look at all it's Lipschitz curves. It's a graph. Yeah, it's a graph. So it's, and the, 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 the important point is it's a graph over the x-coordinate. And that's true in any dimension. OK? And so I mean, if, if I have the same uh, tangent cone at this point, then I also have to worry about all Lipschitz curves going through here. But the, the tangent cone rotates as we go through the set. Um, so there's, a, there's an interesting connection to um, sort of classical combinatorics. Um, and it shows up in how to build these Lipschitz slabs in R2. So in R2, there's a trick. You can use, you can use a, a corollary to a uh, 1930s theorem of the erdos sekeres uh, theorem. And let me just state the, the corollary. This is a really beautiful statement. You're in dimension two. This is a dimension two statement only. Okay? Uh, a set of endpoints, any endpoints, anywhere, contains at least n to the 1 half points that lie on a good Lipschitz curve. Either, so, so here I mean good Lipschitz curves. In this case, it's going to be either in the x direction or the y direction. Okay, so either you can make them go like this or that. Okay. And this means you can exhaust your set after it. About you can weave, make a weaving that's conservative and risk. Right. That's right. You can make some sort of weaving. And, and um, there's a nice algorithm, therefore. So for the y direction, you look at, the, there's, you know, you repeat this several times, and you get a weaving. And you get this beautiful weaving like this. What do you say, um, If you look at, 
uh, the proof, you, you see how to do it without crossings. And, and basically what you do is you divide the setup into two pieces. For the ones that go up, you have this collection of points. And, and it turns out what you know is that in every Lipschitz curve that goes down there, you hit a very small number of points. And so what you do is you just start at the bottom. You look at, at points so that so one point is, is less than another point. If its cone contains the point above, so somewhere in this cone is another point. So you get a partial ordering. And you can use this partial ordering to exhaust by a small number of, of these things. And they, by definition, don't interweave. They don't cross. Okay? So you just take the greediest algorithm. You start at the bottom. You know, the bottom point is one that has no point below it that sees it. You take all those, and then you, you start going up. Something like that is not quite right, but it's close to the correct statement. Okay? Yeah. Right. This, it's you're either you've got either ellipsis going like this or like that. It's it's a it's a proof that that um, pi over two is rational because it's 90. <laughs> OK, so, um, so we, Mariana and I, whoop, Mariana and I have to, uh, to prove uh, a local measure theoretic version of this combinatorial statement, which is unknown. So there's a corresponding combinatorial problem in R3 that's, <coughs> that's unknown. And it's probably not quite correct. Okay, so there you. The way you say it can be, that's probably not. <laughs> Sorry? You just say it's probably not correct, but you also can't be exactly correct. It can't be exactly correct. <laughs> but I don't define exactly for the. I'll, I'm happy to define that later, okay? But the point is that there are some strange. So what, what you're supposed to do is, is, uh, is look at Lipschitz surfaces now. And there are some strange examples that show you that it, the statement, a correct statement, cannot be quite the same as, as this one. OK? So you, you can't just get n to the 1 half, or the version, or n to the d minus 1 over d. OK. That means I'm supposed to go on. OK. OK, so, uh, so what we do is we show that uh, any measurable set um, has um, a cone field, but um, what we prove is a perturbation theorem. So we prove that there are cones with small angle. So we get a statement about pictures like these Lipschitz curves, but they're, they're constrained to have some small, but it, the, the small is universal, is independent of the set. And um, as a corollary of, of this, uh, we show that, uh, all right, so any Lebesgue null set can, ha has a, a tangent field, but with, with small cones for any d uh, dimension. And as a corollary of this plus uh, the heavy technology done before by uh, Alberti, Chenier, and Price, you can then produce d functions and that are uh, not differentiable. So le let me just, um, how much time do I? Right, right. So let, let's just go back and look at the tangent field. So, so we, have, we have thin cones, but they're of a definite fixed angle. Yes. And the definition is that the length, <coughs> OK, so the measure of the set is epsilon. You split it up into to a finite number of pieces. And each piece, so this is an e sub 1 or e sub 2, 
intersects its corresponding Lipschitz curve, any, any Lipschitz curve with the prescribed tangents in, in linear measure bounded by constant times delta times, we, pay, we have a little penalty here, epsilon to the minus del, delta, and then the, we have the correct answer plus one over d. So we just pay uh, a little penalty and we have a, a thin cone. So let me just very rapidly now try and outline Can to you. Huh? Can you go back a sure, you want to go back now? Oh. Let me read them again. I think that's probably a good idea. So, any, uh, by the way, Dennis once said something to me that was very formative. So uh, I, don't, I can't reproduce the exact words, but he asked me to explain something, and then I gave what I thought was an explanation, and he said, you sound like Mr. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the important thing was I realized that, of course, he was correct. Huh? huh? Sorry? What does it mean? You said too many words? I said too many words. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, was being, I was being fancy. And Dennis was calling me out for being fancy. OK. So, um, so we take any uh, set of small measure epsilon in the unit cube. And then we can split it into a finite number of pieces with control on the number so that each piece um, has a cone field. And so when we take each one of those pieces, there is small length. So what's, what's the length going to be? Whoops, I'll go back one more. The measure is epsilon, and each one of these pieces will have measure like epsilon to the minus delta, which is a little penalty, times epsilon to the 1 over d, which is small. And the delta is universal. Okay. And so we have these cone fields. And there, it's important that they're at every point, right? Actually, there's something strange about theorem 1 and theorem 2, because theorem 1 should include theorem 2. The, the point here is that the, the first construction that one does of this leaves a Lebesgue null set. That's bad, because we have to cover Lebesgue null sets, too. And so you have to go in and look at the proof and do something a, a little more complicated there's a continuity type of argument that you have to do to show that the big null sets are OK. So in here, actually, you didn't cover almost everything. You covered absolutely everything. OK. So let me just give you an example now. So we, we start with a set in the unit square. Let's call it E. Are you proving something about every set? Right. Every set. <laughs> every set. But it has small measure. Right? What? It has small measure. There are lots of them, right? There are even more Lipschitz curves than there are small sets. So there, you know, there are many things to control. But we fixed the set, and now we have to make a statement about every Lipschitz curve in the world, at least with small tangent. That's a huge space. Um, so let's form a probability measure out of it. So we take the characteristic function of, of E. I, I wrote this for the probabilists, because the probabilists go nuts if they see chi. Right? <laughs> they, say that's a Fourier, they say that's a Fourier transform, and the Fourier transform comes later. Right? And you just normalize it by 1 over the Lebesgue measure, and that's a probability measure in the unit cube. And therefore, it has a representation. So we have this formula here on the line, and the corresponding formula in Euclidean space of any dimension. And we, so here 1 again is, is, the, is the characteristic function for mathematicians is the indicator function for so probability. measure, statements were about sets, now you've got a measure. Right, so I just turned the, the set into a measure by multiplying the characteristic function by epsilon to the minus 1. Oh, oh times, right. right, so that normalizes it to be a probability measure, so it, it has a a product formula. And so we can take two products, one and these are kind of in the x direction. Those are those pieces on help. Those guys. And then there are the 
there are two pieces in the right direction for each cube. Okay. And uh, it's just a product. It's, so you take finite products, and if you split it in two, you get two finite products, and each one will have a limit. It turns out. So you, you can rearrange. Right. This is the rare occasion where commut commutativity of multiplication is really commutivity. Right. <laughs> so you, you can separate these. Okay. And it's a measure theoretic statement. So you have to you have to check that all of this is okay, but it turns out it's all it's all fine. And um, yeah, well, I'll say something about this a little bit later. Not much later, though. So you get you, you separate it into two products, and the product is gives us the measure. And so the measure has size, it's a function of size epsilon to the minus one. And so one of these two products has to be big. They can't both be small. OK, and so. One of the two products has to be bigger than epsilon to the minus 1 half at every point, or almost every point. And so you, this, this divides E into two sets. And so let's just look at the points that are in the set E sub x, where the first product is, is big. All right. And now, if you take this product, so if you take the product here with the x guys, and you restrict to a line, any line. So here's a line L in the x direction. Then it, the line sees 0, minus 1, and plus 1 in equal length. So you're back to this picture. If you fix a line, just fix a line. And so you just look at the one-dimensional theorem, and you say, Oh, I don't care what my coefficients are. I can integrate out on a line, and I get 1. Because it's, a it's some strange probability measure. It depends on the line. Each, each line has a different probability measure. But I get, I get 1. And so on this, but on the set E sub x, this product is big. So the length of E sub x intersect the curve is small. How small? Exactly epsilon to the minus. E epsilon to the one half. Okay. And so you've just proven that you have an infinitesimal tangent cone. In other words, it's called a line. Right? You haven't. You don't have a cone. Okay. Now there's a big perturbation here. So you 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 go into the great harmonic harmonic analysis engine. And you start turning cranks. And what's interesting is several of the cranks were missing. Or they were missing. And um, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end. Yeah, so um, this is a deterministic problem. But there's a strange sense in which it becomes completely random. And the reason it becomes random is you have to handle the space of Lipschitz curves, which is infinite dimensional and worse. It's just way too big. And you, what you do is you, you, you don't have these perfect products on Lipschitz curves, so you have to build something that looks like one of these things that you can just barely control. And um, the behavior is wildly dependent on the curve, and you have to show it doesn't matter. Uh, so it, it turns into a strangely random type problem. And then you have a list of, um, th this is really just for the experts. So you have, you have a, a, a list of special ingredients. And one of the most interesting things is you, you, it comes back to what's called Cauchy integrals on Lipschitz curves. So, so here's one of the fascinating things. Let me just stop with, uh, here, because there, there's a fascinating uh, point that has finally permeated into analysis, which is um, that the understanding of geometry of sets has to be the same as the understanding of behavior of naturally, that means physically defined operators. And the operator here is, is you have Lipschitz curves. Think of them in the plane. And 
you take Cauchy integrals on Lipschitz curves. So you take an L2 function on the Lipschitz curve. You take um, L2 with respect to, respect to uh, arc length measure. All right, so here's a Lipschitz curve gamma. And you take a function f and L2 on the curve. And now you take the Cauchy integral of f at z, which is 1 over 2 pi i, let's say. This is irrelevant, but you do this in, in your complex variables course. And now you integrate over gamma f of w dw over w minus c. That reproduces nice holomorphic functions that are holomorphic, of, say, above here or below. Okay? And now the question is, does this operator exist on the curve? Now it becomes a singular integral. You can't pop in absolute values here because everything diverges. And so it does have boundary values on gamma if f is in L2 gamma. And there's a big machine relating the geometry to the operator theory. And they're strange basis functions. And the basis functions actually have some relation uh, to these. And because, um, yeah, because you're in this category, it, it turns out miraculously you start, in, you start chanting like a voodoo priest. And it doesn't prove any theorems, but it tells you categories. It's actually uh, a, an amazing example of what I call the, you know, the, the greater Sullivan dictionary theorem. That you, 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 have, you have dictionaries that are not just the Sullivan dictionary um, in, you know, so the, uh, say, Kleinian groups and rational functions, but there is a corresponding uh, set of dictionaries for analysis. And they have relations between different, completely different categories, but somehow related. And this dictionary, which, I mean, I learned this concept from Dennis. This, 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 it's a very powerful linguistic device because it tells you things that could be related. Then you have to prove it. Okay? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Sorry? Yeah, between analysis and geometry. Yeah, between analysis and, and geometry. So, I mean, the natural operator, for example, associated to Lipschitz curves, turns out to be, in any dimension, this Cauchy integral. Okay. Besides yourself, what are some of the names associated with this analysis? Is this like Wolf and uh, So, um, yeah, so um, the analysis, so first there's, there's uh, Alberto Calderon in uh, 1977, and then there's Koifman, uh, Macintosh, Mayer in 1981 or 82, I think it's 82. Uh, and then um, this, this, this dictionary between strange bases and uh, geometry comes from uh, two pieces. So the first one is Koifman, uh, myself, and um, Stephen Sems. So this is perturbations of these simple plus minus one functions that turn out to be a great basis for Cauchy integrals. So that's the operator theory side. And then there's a geometry. Geo so that's operator theory and classical harmonic analysis. And then there's a geometry. And the correct geometry are these things called beta numbers. It's deviation from flatness for sets. So this is something that. Uh, that I invented in um, 1980, I can't remember, six. And then, um, then I, I, I developed some relation, first to the Cauchy integrals, and then later 
uh, I think it's 1990, to the classical traveling salesman problem in Euclidean space. And then uh, David and Sems have massive tomes where they extended this in several different directions to higher dimensions, to you know, interesting surfaces, etc. Uh, no, he he um, he just wasn't working on the Cauchy integral and the geometry aspect. He was working on other problems of uh, Fourier analysis. He did use the Cauchy integral on the circle <laughs> in a very strong way, in a very strong way. However, all the L2 and LP analysis for this was was known essentially since Hardy and, and Littlewood, or certainly since the, the 1960s, all the, all the ingredients. OK, so thanks very much. So any more questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the question was if you're given a uh, Lipschitz uh, function, can you perturb it in the Lipschitz norm to get it nowhere differentiable on E? Right? That's because you basically overpower whatever information you have given. Right? How do you, uh, um, yeah, I, d I don't want to allow smoothness, <coughs> right? If you, if, you, if you make it smooth, then it's too easy. Yeah, no, but uh, you can't perturb it because, it, you know, you could have little pieces that go whoop, like this on infinitely many scales. Right, right, you're smoothing the derivative, and that's not allowed. That's, that's too easy, right? So if, if you give if you give me a C one, I mean, yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm talking about der, uh, L infinity topology for the derivative. Exactly. Yeah. You. Right. The L infinity topology on the derivative. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, let's thank the speaker.